To better understand the role of hypothesis testing in statistics, we are going to pretend that we are Arctic researchers, and we're interested in polar bears. And if you are an Arctic researcher, you know, if you know anything about polar bears, that polar bears love to walk. Polar bears will walk miles per day, sometimes 20 miles or 30 kilometers in a single day, which could easily add up to 100 miles in a week. Now, not every polar bear walks the same number of miles in a week, but on the average, polar bears walk 100 miles per week. At least, that's what we're going to start with for this example. We're going to say that if we measured all polar bears and measured how far each polar bear walked, added them up, divided by the total number of polar bears, we would get a population mean of 100. That's going to be our starting point. So here is how that would look. The average polar bear walks 100 miles per week, and we are going to draw a sample from that population. And my question for you is, how many miles per week is that sample of polar bears going to walk? Knowing what you know about samples and populations, that the mean of the sample should be the same as the mean of the population from which it was drawn, you would naturally answer that that sample of polar bears will walk an average of 100 miles per week. Now we're going to draw a second sample. And again, I ask, how many miles per week would that sample of polar bears walk? And knowing what you know about samples and populations, you would answer 100 miles per week. Now we draw a third sample. It's the same question. How many miles per week is that sample of polar bears going to walk? And knowing what you know about samples and populations, that the mean of the sample should equal the mean of the population from which it was drawn, you know that this third sample of polar bears is going to walk, on average, 100 miles per week. We now have three samples of polar bears drawn from a population with a mean of 100. Each of the samples contains the same mean as the population from which those samples were drawn. But now, we're going to do a treatment on one of these samples. We'll use sample number one. We'll make sample one our experimental group. And we will make samples two and three control groups. Now let me clarify, this is a really dumb way to do experimental design. We don't need two control groups. However, this is a learning example, and I want to illustrate a point with these two control groups. Therefore, if you're doing research, one control group is going to be sufficient. For this example, we're going to use two, and you'll see why in a moment. I mentioned that we were going to do a treatment on this first sample of polar bears. What kind of treatment will that be? To know that, we are going to do a literature review. We are going to review what is known in our field and in related fields to find something that could apply with our sample. And as we conduct our literature review, we find an excellent journal article about whales that tells us that whales who are given caffeine swim 48% farther than similar whales with no caffeine. Whales who drink coffee swim further. And so we want to know, is what is true about whales also true about our subjects of interest, the polar bears? Specifically, we want to know, will giving polar bears caffeine make them walk farther? And we do a study to find out. We give our polar bears caffeine. They each get several cups of coffee first thing in the morning, although the experimental group is getting actual caffeinated coffee. Our two control groups, they get coffee, but it's decaf. We don't tell them that it's not caffeinated coffee. It's part of a placebo study. The two groups that don't get the caffeine, but do get the coffee, probably should not change in their number of miles per week walked. But we want to know, is our experimental group different than our population? And for what reason? Let's look at the results. After doing this study, when the treatment has been completed, 
we examine our first control group and find that the average number of miles walked for that group was 100. And my question is, does this sample mean represent its population mean? Now the answer to that is very straightforward. Yes, it does. The sample mean is exactly the same as the population mean. The sample mean very well represents the population mean. But when we look at our second group, we find that that group has walked 104 miles per week, which is different than 100 miles per week. And now we have a decision to make. Is that 104 different than 100? Yes, yes it is. But is it different enough? Is it substantially different? Is it significantly different? That is what we're going to have to make a determination about. Although 104 is really close to 100 and probably, maybe, perhaps, the sample mean really is 100 and we have some random error that's explaining the difference. It's randomness, not an effect, that explains why this control group has a mean of 104 instead of the 100 that we were expecting. And when I say that we were expecting, that was our assumption. The sample mean should be the same as the population mean. We found a difference, but probably that difference could be due to randomness. Let's check in on our experimental group to see how far they walked. This group walked 150 miles per week, leaving us with two options. Our assumption is that this sample mean is the same as the population mean from which it was drawn, because that's what we know about samples and populations, that this 150 should really be 100, and we have 50 points of measurement error. Of course, there's another possibility. You remember that the whales swam 48% further. So if the caffeine worked, we would expect that the polar bears would walk 148 miles per week. What we found was that they walked 150 miles per week. 150 is different than 148. But now we can ask ourselves, which population does this sample mean better represent? Does it better represent the population from which it was drawn, or does it better represent an experimentally defined population that has a mean of 148? That is actually two hypotheses. One, that the mean of the sample and population are the same, the second hypothesis, that the mean of the sample and population from which it was drawn are different. Which hypothesis are we going to test? It would make sense that because we want to know if caffeine improves performance in polar bears, we will test the hypothesis that the sample mean and the population mean are different. But in fact, that is not the hypothesis that we're going to test. We're going to test the hypothesis that the sample mean and the population mean are the same, that there is no difference, and this is called a null hypothesis. Why do we test a null hypothesis? The simple answer is that we test a null hypothesis because it is falsifiable. Falsifiability means that the hypothesis makes sufficiently precise predictions that, if it was wrong, we could measure it. That doesn't mean that the hypothesis is wrong. It means that it is sufficiently precise that if it was wrong, we could demonstrate that it was wrong. That is what makes the hypothesis falsifiable. One that can definitely be demonstrated to be false.